Hey students, welcome back. In this lesson, I would like to start by asking you one question. If you were the white pieces here, would you take this rook? This is a hanging rook. I want you to take a moment and think about it. And when you're ready, I really want to know what your answer was. But before you write it down, because I'm going to ask you to leave it in a comment, guys, I really want to know your feedback. I want to know for my records, how many of you said that you would take or not, but not, not yet. So just know that after the queen takes a rook, that queen is going to be trapped by bishop b7. So the queen can only go to a7 and the rook could go easily after the queen and you're going to have to trade your queen for that other rook. So basically what I'm asking you is, do you feel comfortable with trading your queen for two rooks. And the reason why I'm asking this is because every time I have this lesson with one of my students, even students who are over 2,000, what I do is I show them this position and I just tell them, let's finish this position, let's take it from here, what would you do? So what they do is they quickly realize there's a hanging piece. And of course, they're suspicious, they look into it and they realize that the queen is going to be trapped. Now, many of them already know that two rooks are better than one queen. And if you do the math, 5 and 5 is 10, the queen is only 9. But not only that, it is proven that the two rooks working together are just better than a queen. But even with that knowledge, my students tell me the same thing that I would say many years ago. I, I understand that the two rooks are better, but I just don't feel comfortable with that. I just, my queen is easier to use. I'd rather keep my queen on the board. Well, that cannot be the case anymore. And after this lesson, you guys are going to be looking forward to your next opportunity to trade your queen for your opponent's rooks and demonstrate how well you know how to do this. And that's how it should be. So in this lesson, I'm going to show you a game played by the fifth world champion, but I'm also going to give you a few other positions for you to actually understand this concept. If I wanted to finish this lesson right now, all I need to tell you is the two rooks are better than the queen and you're going to be like, okay, but that's not enough. I need more. Well, the only other thing that you need to know is that whenever you have two rooks versus queen, the key is to keep your rooks coordinated. They need to be helping each other. They need to be connected. With this information, that's enough. That's actually the bottom line to this concept. But I know that if I just tell you that, you're going to continue to hesitate before you trade your queen for your opponent's rook. So I'm going to give you that game. I'm going to show you a few positions. The most important ones that I really want to address are this one right here where the two rooks are completely uncoordinated. They're not able to help each other, so the queen should have an advantage here. And the other one is this position in front of you where there is a passed pawn. So you need to know how your rooks help that pawn get to the end easily. But of course, the other positions that we're going to analyze are just as important. The more information you have on this topic, the better, the more confident you're going to feel when you play your game. So let's get started. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to go over the game that led to this position. And this is a game played by the fifth world champion. And he was playing with the white piece. So let me put everything back. And the game started with the moves knight f3, pawn to d5. And then here, notice how they quickly transposed into a Kali Sucre torch system. This is a very nice system that this is one of the reasons why I wanted to show you the entire game. After knight f6, pawn e3, Pawn e6. I'm not going to go too deep into, into the opening, but I really want you to see how he plays this system. Basically, it's like the London system that we already addressed because you just need to know where your pieces go. And this system could turn really aggressive if you really understand the plan. It could be positional if you wanted to, or it could be aggressive. So after bishop d3, pawn to c5, then pawn to b3, important so that they don't do pawn to c4, and of course, we're going to develop the bishop through b2. Then after knight to c6, then castle, bishop d6, bishop b2, castle, and now pawn to a3. This is a very common move on this system because basically we don't want the knight to go to b4 to attack the bishop from d3. So after pawn to a3, b6, and now knight to e5. Now before I show you this move, I wanted to say in the collie, if you want to try it, basically, this is what you need to know. Your pieces go like this. The knight goes on f3, the bishop on d3 aiming at the, at the king side. We have the other bishop in the fianchero because this is locked. So we do it because we know the bishop is coming to b2. And then this knight typically goes to d2 and the queen goes to e2. Now, in this game, they're going to do knight e5 right away. And this is the middle game plan. So you're going to put your knight on e5. 
and that's going to be followed by F4, not only supporting that knight, but allowing your rook to do the rook lift and the rook rollover. So after knight e5, we have bishop b7, then knight e2. So you see, they're not going to do anything crazy until they develop all of their pieces. Now, after queen e7, we have f4, like I said, rook f to d8, and now the rook lift. So rook f3, and this rook is going to come to h3 or g3. Now, guys, this is customary. When I used to play the, this system, I really liked it because I had this plan. I, I really like the plan of bringing the rook over. And you're going to see how it is used in this game. So after rook f3, knight e4, very nice move by the black pieces, then the rook comes over to the h file. So notice how we're not castling to the opposite side. We don't have open lines. So we're putting the rook in front of the pawns. That way the rook can help us. So after f5, we have bishop takes knight, d takes e4 and now the queen comes in with the rook so we're already putting a lot of pressure on that king and the black pieces now went bishop e5 this is a necessary move if they had done something like g6 can you guys come up with the best move for the white pieces well if you pause the video you should have seen this move knight takes g6 and we're going to try to do it in our head if h takes g6 then we have queen h8 king f7 followed by rook h7 checkmate so knight g6 pawn takes queen h7 followed by checkmate so of course the black pieces did not do pawn to g6 they took and now here's the thing the white pieces could take back just like that or they could take on h7 first in between move the king moves and then we take on e5 but there's one problem with that after that happened, queen h7, king f7, pawn takes e5, rook h8. So here's the thing, the queen is trapped, but if you look closer, we could actually just trade the queen for the two rooks. And here, guys, many people say, oh, I sacrificed my queen for the rooks. Well, you're not sacrificing anything. You're actually winning material. The two rooks are better than the queen, so you're not sacrificing anything. But many people here, they just don't feel comfortable. And to be honest, I wanted to show you this game because this is the worst case scenario when you have two rooks versus queen. Notice how the rooks are on complete opposite sides of the board. So like I said before, the bottom line is your rooks need to be coordinated. Now with that said, you're going to see how in this game they actually found a way to connect the rooks. And that's the key. If you have the two rooks, you need to find a way to have them connected. They need to be working with each other. So after they took on h8, it is the black pieces to move, and they went bishop a6, very nice move. Then knight f1, trying to bring this knight to a better square, queen d7, and now the white pieces set themselves up for a tactic. So this is the move that they did, rook to d1. Now again, I'm going to ask you to pause your video and see if you can find that tactic that the black pieces have right here. Well, this is the tactic. There's a pin on this pawn, and that means we can take on e5 safely. If the pawn takes, we get that rook. Now, why did I say that the white pieces set themselves up for this tactic? Well, all that the white pieces were looking for here was for a way to open up the file. So the rooks cannot help each other. They cannot connect with each other because they're not open files. So after they move pawn to d5, we're hitting the knight. So they just went knight to g4, and now pawn takes e6. Now, notice that we did not win anything with that pawn to d5. The only thing we did was open the d file. And you're going to see how from the moment the two rooks get connected, the queen is just going to be passive and the white pieces are going to have the initiative. So after queen e6, rook h to d8. There you go. This is what I mean, guys. If you have been wondering what does he mean by connected or coordinated, this is what it means. They're protecting each other. So after rook h to d8, we have bishop e5 because if they didn't, the white pieces are already threatening to go to d7 and they have to give us the queen for only one of the rooks. So what I mean is this, if they did a bad move like pawn to g6, rook d7, and now here they have to give us the queen because the bishop is cutting off this diagonal, but even if the king could go here, the rook is going to come up and pin it. So now you can see how the two rooks proved to be better than that queen. So in this game, of course, they did not do g6, they went bishop e5. But then we have pawn to c4, and now look at this bishop, how he goes 
very passive to e8. Now, rook 1 to d5, our rooks are being active, they're putting a lot of pressure, and we're threatening to do the following. We're threatening to do pawn to h3. When the knight leaves, we're going to do rook e5, skewing the queen and the bishop. So after rook d5, we have pawn f4, h3, f takes e3. Again, if they had taken here, the rook is going to come to e5. So they took with the pawn, and now, instead of taking that knight, they went knight g3, look at that knight, then pawn e2, the knight took on e2, then knight e3, and now we're not going to go to e5 because after queen g6, they're threatening checkmate, so we cannot even take on e8. So instead, the white pieces realized that and they went rook to g5. We're still putting pressure on g7, but more than that, guys, since he had the initiative, it's very important that we do not forget we have to keep our opponent without any counterplay. So he realized what his opponent could be threatening with the knight on e3, and he's taking care of that. Now the two rooks and the bishop are basically leaving this queen without many squares. So after rook g5, pawn to g6, and now it is a good moment for you to pause the video and see if you can come up with the next move for the white pieces. Even better guys, if you come up with three candidate moves. So three moves that you think we should be looking into right now. Well, the move that the white pieces did here was knight f4. We we're bringing the knight into the game, and after queen e7, we have rook g6. Now, notice how he's hanging, but of course, there is a tactic involved. Now, again, pause the video, and guys, I know this is a little bit annoying, but you should know by now, this is only going to help you. So try to do this on your own. Try to find the combination here if the black pieces had taken on d8. So white pieces to move, what can you find? Well, if you post a video and you didn't find it, well, try finding it now with one hint. It is a white pieces to move, and they have checkmate in two moves. Forced checkmate in two moves. Well, the move that we're looking for is check, only move, and then checkmate. So bishop, knight, and rook. Let me go back, because in this game, they did not take the rook on, on the eight. Instead, they went knight f5. Now we have check on f6 and after king g8 we have another nice tactic so we have rook takes e8 queen takes and then we take on f5 so basically what we did was we traded one of our rooks for two minor pieces and you should know at this point in the course that two minor pieces are better than one rook so now you know two minor pieces are better than one rook two rooks are better than one queen so they traded and now look at this we have rook and two minor pieces versus queen so after pawn to e3, rook e5, and the black pieces just resigned. This pawn is going nowhere. We have rook and two minor pieces plus two pawns. This should be a very easy end game to finish. Now, guys, we're going to go over the other positions that I wanted to show you. But if you have the time after the lesson, come back to this position, set it up, and try to finish it versus an engine. So you could go to Lee Chess and player versus one of those engines and see if you can actually make it work. You should be winning this easily. Again, you have more pieces, but see if you can actually make it work. It requires a lot of concentration and the ability to keep your pieces coordinated. All right, so here we have the next position. You're going to be in charge of the black pieces and it is your turn to move. So my question to you is, what would you do if you weren't the black pieces? So feel free to pause the video, take a moment and come up with your next move. Well guys, if you pause the video, if you have your move, let me just tell you this. Now that you know that the two rooks are better than the queen, the move that we're looking for is a forced sequence to do exactly that, to trade your queen for your opponent's rooks. And the move was, queen takes e1, check. When the rook takes, we just take right back. So in this game, that's exactly what happened. And then after the king went to h2, notice how we have a pass pawn for the black pieces and a pass pawn for the white pieces. Now, it is very simple, guys. Whenever we have a pass pawn, the two rooks, if it is your opponent's pawn, the two rooks, they just need to double up and put pressure on that pawn and the queen cannot defend it. So if I had these two rooks on the d-file and the queen was defending it, I could just take it. The queen is not going to take, the other rook is protecting. So this is where you really see the two rooks being more powerful. If the pawn is your pawn, then the queen is not going to be able to take it because you're going to be defending it with the rooks as well. Now, this is not enough. In order for you to win this successfully, you have to know the technique. And the technique is actually very simple. You have to use one of your rooks to protect the pawn from behind. 
and the other rook is going to take care of the queen. So basically what happens in these cases is that when you have the rook behind the pawn and you try to push it, well, this queen is going to get in the way. But that's when you use your rook to come over and attack the queen. So one rook protects the pawn and helps him go to the end. The other rook gets rid of that queen. So here the black piece has just continued with rook to c8, protecting the pawn, queen c3, then rook d1. So notice how the rook is trying to get to d3 and help the pawn continue. So we have queen c2, then they went back to e1, queen c3, rook e2. So now the rook, instead of going to d1, which didn't work, they're going to the seventh rank and they're trying to get one of the two pawns. So after rook e2, king g3, if they had done something like pawn a3, trying to protect this pawn instead, then we have rook f2, followed by rook f6, rook b6, rook b3. So look at that maneuver, and you can only come up with this kind of maneuvers if you understand the technique, if you understand what you're looking for. Now, in this game, again, they just went king g3. Then we take this pawn, pawn to d5. That pawn is not going anywhere. So rook a6, not only taking care of that pawn, but the rook is getting ready to go to b3. And in this case, it would be a pin. So after rook a6, queen b4, then rook b6 attacking the queen, queen e7, c3, pawn to d6. And now I really want you guys to pause the video and see if you can come up with the move that made the white pieces resign. Well, the move that we're looking for here is rook takes pawn, so that pawn is not going anywhere. And here the white pieces just resigned. If they had taken, then we have pawn to c2 and the pawn is going to promote no matter what. So this is another great example. I didn't want to show you the entire game because I just needed you to understand the technique that we have to utilize when we have a pass pawns and two rooks versus queen. And now we're going to go to the position that we started this lesson with. So here we are guys, uh, the white pieces like you already know, the white pieces basically took the rook and after bishop b7, there's one thing I didn't tell you. In this game, they did not take right away. They actually came up with this move. Knight takes e6. Oh, and by the way, now that I see this knight hanging here, if the black pieces, instead of trapping the queen, they just go bishop takes knight, well, we just get the queen out and we just keep the exchange. So instead of doing that, they went bishop e7. And then here, instead of taking right away, we have this nice combination, which only makes sense afterwards. So after knight takes, pawn takes, 96, so we're hitting that queen all the time, so they have no time to get our queen, or we take on c7. So 96, pawn takes, 96, and after queen c6, now we take on f8. The first to take back, and now we have this move knight to d8. The idea is to remove this bishop. First of all, this battery is really uh, aggressive, but after we take on b7, we're going to be able to pin the knight and we get that knight for free. So if they had done something like, I don't know, going here, we take, and now bishop e4, without that bishop there, we get this knight. So that's what they calculated before they actually sacrificed the knight on e6. So that's really, really powerful. Now in this game, after queen c7, knight b7, the black pieces did not take right away. They just went knight c3 in between move. They know they're going to lose the knight anyways, so they are going to at least get a pawn for it. So pawn takes knight, and after queen b7, look at this position. We have bishop versus bishop, and two rooks versus queen. And of course we have an extra pawn, but that's not going to be the point here. So the next move was bishop e4, activating our bishop, then queen c7, bishop d5 check, king g7, and notice how the queen just cannot do much. So Pawn to c4, now that bishop is as active as it could be. Bishop d6, putting pressure on h2, g3. And this move, of course, they do it to not allow the black pieces to take on h2, but more than that, we are opening up a escape window, which is not the same color as the bishop. But also, this move helps us control this bishop. So now the bishop has one less square to go to. So after g3, pawn to g5, rook e3, Notice how the rooks are getting ready to start putting pressure. So pawn to g4 preventing us from going to f3 and f7. Then we go rook e8, h5. Guys, and if you're asking yourself, why are they just pushing pawns? Well, there's not much they could do here. So after h5, we have check, king h7, 
Time to bring the other rook through open files. Queen c5, rook g5, trying to put pressure on, on h5, king h6, rook f5, queen b4, and then after rook e6, the black pieces just resign. There's nothing they could do here. Once they move the, the king, we're going to take on h5, or we could even do rook g5 and the black pieces are resigned. So again, you could do the same thing we mentioned before. You could put this position versus an engine and see if you have what it takes to finish them. Now, the last position, and this is going to be extremely quick, the last position is actually a, a position that I got in one of my games. And here we have it. Uh, this is something that I'm not that proud of because I think I actually made a mistake here. But basically, I'm the black pieces. And what I did was I just sacrificed on b2 because I calculated that if they take, I take back and I'm pinning their queen anyways, which I don't think was that good. But what my opponent did here, which was a mistake, they did knight to c2. And now I had the opportunity to trade my queen for the two rooks. And of course I did it, but I have to say I wasn't that happy here because there's one thing that is not present. And that is that my rooks are not connected. But worse than that, it is really hard for me to develop this bishop and castle, then develop the other bishop and connect the rook. So I knew it was going to take me a lot of time. But I think that this game turned out to be good for me because they also had difficulties to coordinate their pieces and attack. So I wanted to show you this position for you to not only see how I had this opportunity in a real game and I took it, but also I wanted to see if you still have energy to find a tactic that I found in this game. So after I took, my opponent went pawn to f4, then I put my rook back on this rank, which is really, really powerful. Then my opponent starts getting his pieces out of this rank. So he went king f3, and now there's a very nice tactic, simple but nice, for the black pieces. So take your time, pause the video, and see if you can figure it out. Well, guys, we're talking about a two-move combination here, which was... Rook takes e2. If the queen takes, then we fork and we get the queen back. So of course my opponent did not do it, he just went queen d1. But now there is another tactic here for you to find. It's a little bit harder than the one that we just found. But again, pause the video and see if you can find a forcing combination to win material. Well, here I realized that these two are on the same diagonal, so this move came to mind. But if I go bishop g4 and they take, I just don't have the fork. It would be really nice if I had that fork. But I said, you know what? What if I go rook f2 first, check. The only move is to take with the bishop, so it's forced. And now that the bishop is the one on f2, I'm going to do bishop g4. So rook f2, only move. Now bishop g4, I'm skewering this, the king and the queen. And after they take, I go with the fork. So they move and I just get the queen. So this game, I was only able to win it because of this tactic. But I have to say that my trade of queen for the two rooks, even though it makes sense in most cases, I just didn't feel that comfortable because I remembered that the main rule is that the two rooks have to be coordinated. So guys, I'm going to leave it here. Like always, feel free to ask me any questions that you might have. If you haven't done it, please let me know if before this lesson you felt comfortable trading your queen for your opponent's rooks or not. Just put yes or not. So with that said, I will see you guys next time.